Hey, this is Ike, and Brad and Rob are all here with us, and we're excited that you guys signed in to join us for our second meeting of the SQL Pass book readers. Um, this book that we're reading is the SQL Server 2012 T-SQL Fundamentals by Itzik Ben-Gan, and we're reading the first three chapters, chapter one through three. So there's 22 people on right now, and we're glad to have you. Some of you are familiar names. We know some of you. Um, do me a favor. Can you raise your hand if you read the book this month? So we practiced raising our hand last time. Oh, there's some hand raising. Yeah. So those of you, you guys read the first three chapters. That's all, not the whole book, but just the first three chapters. Everybody with their hand raised. Okay. Awesome. Uh, well, that's a lot of you. Some of you didn't get the reading done this month, but that's okay. Hopefully you still find value in our time together. Um, you can put your hands down, by the way. Thanks for doing that. Um, so I've got some ideas on how we can review this and use the most out of our hour together. And one of the ideas I had is that I thought we could each say one thing that we learned from the reading and kind of teach each other that way. So. Um, raise your hand if you learned one thing in these three chapters. Actually, can I raise my hand? I don't know. I guess I can't raise my hand since I'm an organizer. But I definitely I learned like three things. Okay, raise your hand if you can flip through the reading and you learned one thing. Okay, that's actually... Keep your hands up the whole time, please, because we're going to sort by hand raising. And you guys are all going to get a chance to talk, but... Actually, I think I'm going to go first. And uh, the thing I learned was um, try the some of the try statements, um, like try cast and try convert. For some reason, that kind of escaped me. I didn't know about that. So um, for those of you who are unfamiliar, let me show you try cast. Try cast T SQL. I thought this was really awesome. So for those of you who have done normal casting, um, if you're going to try to convert something from one data type to the next data type, it will just straight fail if uh, it's illegal to cast that. And let me show you that real quick. Let me bring up Windows and I'll show you that. OK, so new query. Can you see my screen, Brad, Rob? Yes. Yep. It's, and, the, the font's going to be tiny, but I mean, it's technically <laughs> legible. Oh, it is? Okay, so let me, that's a good point. Let me um, change my resolution real quick. Uh, that's probably a good idea for all of us to do if we're going to sh be sharing, but I'll drop my resolution down um, maybe to 1280 by 768 is probably a good one. Does that look a little clear? Yes. And let's see how readable your SQL is. Do you think you could font bump about 10? Yep, 10 I points? can. Uh -huh. Yep. So I'm at size 10. I can go to size 20. OK, is that good? Looks great to me. Yeah, looks yeah, pretty big right, to good. me. OK. Awesome. I don't even need my glasses to read it now. Nice, OK. So notice these, are, I've got 91 rows in the customer's table right now. And if I wanted to cast cust ID to int, it would look like this. And it works perfectly, right? Um, let's do an asterisk after that. If I want to cast company name to an int, company name is actually a string, you know, it's a var char, um, but I'm going to cast it as an int, and instead I get a conversion fail when converting the in var char value, customer, whatever, to data type int. So it's telling me the string can't go to a number, right? But if instead I do a try cast and run it, notice that first column name just says null. So rather than failing the entire query, it lets the query go, but it nulls the things that it can't convert. And then it continues to convert the things it can convert. 
So I just thought that was like an amazing kind of added feature of SQL 2012. And uh, anyway, I learned that. All right. So um, Brad, do you want to go? Yeah, sure. Sorry, I was on. Uh... Are you there, Brad? Yep. Can you hear me OK? Yep, yep. OK, sorry, I was on mute. Um, yeah, so the thing that I learned was the uh, contained databases. Uh, so it's kind of an interesting scenario where you can get your uh, DB logon credentials get embedded into the database. And um, I don't know if you're able to find that in your Kindle Cloud Reader there uh, easily. But um, the interesting thing is uh, we were talking right before this meeting, uh, and, and Rob brought up a neat scenario where you could, as a developer, if you're just kind of prototyping something, you could get a fully contained database with your database user account embedded into it and then just restore it up to a new uh, SQL Server instance, potentially one in Azure. And, and then you could open Management Studio directly from your local machine and log in with that database user. So you wouldn't need an instance level credential uh, you know, for a shared hosting provider like Azure. You wouldn't need to have any modifications to the instance itself. It's all just contained within your database. So I think as me being kind of the software developer angle, I think that's really useful to me. One of the things I always struggle with is, is getting the credentials right in SQL Server instances. I never understand what permissions to give to who and, and where the account should live, whether it should live on the database or it should live on the instance level. So I think that's a really helpful feature. Yeah, awesome. So yeah, I put it up here on my screen. Can you guys read that OK? Yep. SQL Server 2012 supports a feature called Contained Databases that breaks the connection between a database user and a server level login. The user is fully contained within the specific database is not tied to a login at the server level. Yeah, I learned that too. I thought that was great. I've seen that before, but I still thought it was pretty impressive. What about you, Rob? Did you learn something? Mine wasn't so much learning something new. I just actually really enjoyed Chapter 2 and that uh, just that feel of like doing calisthenics and just going over all these basic things. Because sometimes when there's problem solving or wanting to find a solution, it's so easy as engineers to want to over-architect and look way past the basic scenario. I just actually love just going over you know, the case statements and nulls and how it all comes together. And I thought it was just really fun refresher. And of course, I read it in Itzik's voice, which was fun too. Yeah, yeah. OK, so we're going to do something a little bit scary. We're going to um, unmute Alberto Otero. And Alberto, can you hear us? Let's see if Alberto has a mic. I don't know that yeah. we can, but it, can Alberto go to the chat log or the question and tell us one thing he learned? Yeah, Alberto, if you don't have a mic, go ahead and send a question. OK, he says, yeah, he says, I do not have a mic. So we'll go ahead and uh, maybe move on to the next person. But Alberto, go ahead and type it in the chat log, and then we'll make sure to read we'll it back read it to the over. whole group. Yeah. OK, let's try David. Um, David Twisselman, can you hear us? I can hear you. Nice, David. What's one thing you learned? Uh, Looking at really what was standard SQL nowadays, um, I always try and use standard SQL, but things like is null uh, caught me off guard. I've always used that, and I really should be using something like Colise. Yeah, right. Yeah, that that's it. I see that done a lot, and I yeah, Colise is pretty neat, isn't it? Because you can um, actually, David, can you explain why Colise is better than is null? You said uh, standard, another reason to it. Well, it's standard SQL, but also that Colise can take multiple parameters uh, to, you know, so if the first one's null, it can go to the second, to go to the third. Right, right. That is awesome. So let me actually show that um, here. Okay. So um, let's take a look at the definition here where. Um, we've got a nullable column. I think we have region is a nullable column. So let's do that. Let's do select region from sales.customers. Rob, can you see this OK? Yes, it looks great. OK. And if you scroll down on region, you'll see a lot of different states. And you'll see just different um, provinces in Canada, like British Columbia, 
you'll see CA for California, right? And then you'll see a whole bunch of nulls here. So we can say region and just an empty string as region. And let's execute that. And that says if it's a null in region, just empty it out. Just blank the string out. And that's what it, or we can say actually we want it to be in A for not applicable. And there's a whole bunch of NAs, but then our real ones still show up. And what we could say is we could say, well, we want region, and if region is null, then add country. And so we get a bunch of countries instead of regions if there's no region. And if country happened to be null also, we would get it in slash A, which I don't have an example of that, but, but uh, that's how that function is used. It's really useful. Awesome. Thanks a lot for that, um, David. I appreciate your time in doing that. Um, so Alberto got back to us in the chat here. Uh, so he didn't have a mic, but he says the the thing that he learned, he says the new top and offset fetch filters to control the number of rows retrieved by the query. So he learned about those two new filters. That's actually so as a developer, what's your first thought when you see that? Server-side paging, right? Yes. R right, right. Definitely. Yeah, yeah, that is really, really awesome. And let, let's actually cover that. What Alberto just said was offset. So um, I'll bring up the Kindle app. Oh, actually, excuse me, I have that here. Okay, so um, where was it? That was in the select. That was at the end of the select chapter, right? So it was like right. Um, right before the formatting gate time. Um, what's the problem with Kindle Cloud Reader? Let's you can't do a find. There. I don't know if I can. I was looking for that earlier and I couldn't find it. Um, but yeah, the syntax is at the end of a select statement, it allows you to take like 25 rows and skip 25 rows. And so the use case for something like that is to create paging. And the example that everybody uses for paging is like Google, right? They always say, oh, see, here it is, offset fetch. So can you guys see my screen OK? So the syntax looks like this where it's select a column list from the table, order by, and then it's offset 50 rows, fetch next 25 rows only, right? So you're saying skip 50. It, it's like skip take in Entity Framework if you've ever used that. But you're saying, I only want to see 25 rows at a time. And right here, he's on the third page. And the example for paging everyone uses is Google, right? Where we could say, give me everything you know about San Diego. and you're seeing these pages down here. Here's 10 pages, and you're getting about 20 links per page. And then you go to page two, and you get the next 20 links per page, right? It's kind of neat, huh? That's paging, and this is a really good way to implement that. Um, thanks, Alberto. I appreciate that. So we got one more. Also, the feature, too, is that if you're coming from like a MySQL, if you're coming from like a MySQL or Postgres background, they've had the limit and offset for a while. It, I've really enjoyed having SQL Server kind of get into that same type of syntax. It's really made jumping around from database to database easier for me. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. OK, so the next is, oh, did you say there's one more Prince, John? Yeah, yeah. Prince gave us one in the, in the uh, chat as well. And he says the one thing uh, that he had learned was the relationship between the schema and the table in reference to the database. Nice. Yeah, that's pretty key, right? In fact, you saw me use that in this code right here. Um, I didn't point it out, but um, sales is the schema, and customers is the table. So schema just allows us to organize tables like this. Now, to be honest, I'll tell you what I think about this, really. I don't like organizing a customer's table in sales, because why? Why would customers go to sales? I mean, maybe customer support needs customers. Maybe 
um, inventory management needs to know who the customer is. I mean, a lot of people need customers, right? But where I have used this is like if I was going to put the data warehouse database in the same database as the OLTP database and just have the tables be different, um, sometimes there's a use case for that, particularly if you're creating like a data warehouse for 300 customers and you need every customer has their own database and the database is cloud hosted so you don't want to have like 300 more databases so you would just put the data warehouse schema right in the OLTP database to save on money. I know that's a convoluted answer but we've recently just done this as a company. So we would have the schema have DW in it and all the OLTP stuff would stay with DBO or OLTP. Anyway, that's kind of one example. That's so, a good example, by the way. On the DBA side of things, I've used the schemas for like um, when I'm importing data, having like a staging or dirty schema that I dump data into, and I'll have like a utility schema where some of our internals and tools and stuff are in the database under utility schema, just some other things like that. Or uh, really hot tables that are cached, I'll have a cache schema, and we know that that data is, um, is, is going to be pretty dirty, and we're using it specifically for a cache, so it's not mixed in with our... Uh, you know, real core business stuff. Yeah, I like using schema for like deprecating features. Yeah. Like this is yep. like, no good. You know, don't use this <laughs> schema, right? If That's you it, yeah. if you type in don't use this before in your select statement, you know you're making a mistake, right? <laughs> <laughs> There's no miscommunication, right? So that's interesting. So from a developer perspective, I've seen this used and I've never I mean I've understood kind of what it's doing, but I, I didn't really understand the use case. So it sounds like what you're describing is almost analogous to namespaces in code. Is, would that be accurate to say you're using schemas to kind of organize yeah. under specific namespaces? Yeah, I would agree with that. Hmm. That's interesting. Yep, yep, yep. Okay, cool. Okay, so the, the next one is, um, can you hear me still? Yep. Yes. Yep. yep. Okay, cool. The next one is Jess. So Jess Comfort, can you tell us one thing you want? Jess, we can hear you. Is Jess there? Oh, she says no mic. Okay, I'm going to mute Jess. We'll come back. No mic. Oh. I... But we're hearing words per minute. <laughs> we can hear her. Yeah, we definitely can hear her. <laughs> OK. So... She, she did post to the chat, though, or he, actually, I'm not sure. So sorry, Jess. Uh, and said, uh, the whole discussion of outer joins was very useful, specifically how it is important to be careful with predicates in the where clause for non-preserved side. That was very useful, yes. And you could learn an awful lot from that. Let me just repeat. When you're doing joins, you can, it, you can specify a criteria in the on statement. And that criteria is only whether or not that data is going to get joined together, not whether that's a final include in the data set or not. So, yeah, I agree with its discussion on that. If you don't want the data in the data set or you do want it in the data set, then keep it in the where filter. Don't put it in the join criteria. I see a lot of, like, developers who are unclear on that make that mistake and, and get bad results. So... Um, yeah, that was very good. Wait, can Thanks, you? Thanks, Jess. I appreciate. That. Can you say what you said one more time? Sorry, I think I missed part of it. You said right, so developers we, get what part wrong? Well, you see how a join has an on criteria here. Mm -hmm. They'll use that on as opposed to a where filter. So they'll put stuff in there, and that is not really a final filter of what goes in or doesn't go into the um, set coming out. That is just your join criteria. So you can get bad data by relying on that as a where filter. And that's what he was talking about specifically. Got it, got um, it. It's in, it's in the same section where he talks about the um, order of the join also being important. And I like that part also where um, if you have inner joins mixed with outer joins, do you have your outer joins first or your inner joins first? And I'll just, um, I wish that we could just have people really quickly answer that in chat. I'm not sure why chat doesn't work. Um, but 
Yeah, chat's a little bit strange. I'm able to answer yes. the questions that the people are sending in. So feel free to send questions to chat. I, I'm able to answer those, but it doesn't look like I can send a message out, but we can just talk. So I think that part's yeah, fine. Yeah, yeah. Anyway, the answer is that you, you want your outer joins last in your join list, because if they're first, the inner joins will come along afterwards and filter them out. So um, it'll be, it'll result to an inner join no matter what. So you want to keep them, you want to keep um, joins to be left, I should say, left outer joins last. And right outer joins are considered not standard practice. So we avoid right outer joins, we use left outer joins, and we keep them at the end of the join criteria list. That's our general rule of thumb. Okay, and I can show you demos on that if uh, people have further questions on that, but let's save some of those demos to the end of our time. Um, Joyce, um, I just unmuted you. Can you hear me? Let's see if Joyce has a mic. Joyce, if you don't have a mic, feel free to send a message to the chat. Oh, it looks like she just sent oh. a, She says she can hear us but has no mic. Okay, if you want to go ahead, Joyce, and type in the, um, the section that you thought was useful to you out of the book into the chat, then we can read that for the whole group. That'd be great. And we can move on and maybe to this, the next person. This next person, I'm going to mess up their name. So I'm saying, you know, you can just you know them saying it again, you explain it. If it doesn't work, you know, we can talk about it first. Okay. Okay. I just unmuted her. Zaya, <laughs> do you have one thing that you learned that you want to share with us? Mm, okay. I don't see her responding, so I'm going to mute her. OK, so we're going to try that, by the way, every month. So if while you're reading, if you when you do the reading, you can come up with one short thing that you want to share with us. And we'll probably just randomly call on people, especially as our attendee list gets larger and larger. Um, the next thing that I thought we could do to review is to use a website that uh, my partner wrote um, at the monastery called SQL Flashcards. So we wrote this little kind of neat application. Um, John is sitting right here next to me. And um, we, he, he leads another track um, that we're responsible for on web development. And so he created a whole bunch of cards for web development. And then we use the same interface to create SQL cards. So it's possible to contribute cards to SQL flashcards if you'd like. But I created a whole bunch in SQL and T-SQL. So it's all based on our reading. So before I thought we'd kind of go over this. Before we jump in, yeah. Joy Joyce put her question in there. So I want to make sure we, we didn't forget that. So she, she said she learned several um, new SQL 2012 features. One is concat, to concatenate and replace nulls with empty strings. I totally like that one. Yeah, that's yeah, interesting. That was really cool, actually. So um, let's go back and show that. So. Um, select star from sales.customers, right? These on the fly demos are terrifying to me, by the way, because I don't know if what I'm doing is right, right? So we know like region has null, right? So let's let's put region in. And then um, okay, there's a bunch of nulls there. Okay. And here we can say, let's let's put region ahead and get rid of that actually. And then ahead of that, let's put city, state, region. Is it, is it, is that right? Hang on. It's post, city, no, region is state, and it's postal code. Let's do that. OK, let's execute that. All right, so that, that gives us these three columns right here. Do you guys see that? Can, Rob, can you see that OK? Yeah, it looks good. OK. So if I was going to do an address, it would actually look like this, right? City plus, plus region plus a space plus a postal code, right? Like if I were going to do something where I was going to print um, on an envelope. So if I execute that, I get what is this? This is no good, right? I get a bunch of nulls. Oh, that's a good one. 
then I get nulls, then, then that's a good one, right? And the problem is when there's a null in the data set and you concatenate, you just get null returned. So if instead I use concat and I take the concatenation operator, the, the plus out of it, and I just common delimit the list, I've not tried this, by the way, in real life in this demo, so let's just see what I get. And did I do a closing? Nope, here we go. Closing paren as address line two, something like that, and then run that. And now I get legitimate data. Um, so you can see that concat is much better than just the concatenation operand because when it finds nulls, it knows what to do with it. It knows, oh, we're just going to kind of skip it and give it an empty string to concatenate as we go through. Now, if I wanted to write this out um, by hand, just using like is null, it would look pretty ugly. It would look like this. Let's take concat out of there and say, is null like that, right? And then take that out, replace it with a plus. And then we know that's not going to be as null, so we wouldn't do it there, but we have to do it for region. Is null plus. That's already painful. Plus. Um, no, it's an empty string, and then take the, and then it would be is null. So this will give us the same thing, or we could use um, coalesc like, and we mentioned before, take that as a space out, okay. And then run this, and we'll get the same address line too, but the code is much uglier. Like, what code would you rather use? This is null concatenating code all over, or just concat these, you know, four things together for me, and if, if you get any, uh, if you get any nulls, you know what to do about it, right? You'd much rather have this previous one. So, yeah, I like that too. I think she's totally right. So, uh, David, right. David Chan. It's also going to be way easier to maintain. Yeah. Wait, say that again, Rob. It's going to be way easier to maintain. Like, an address is a very predictable scenario, but, you know, imagine something else where, you know, it could be, uh, you know, eight or nine or ten fields or more, and, they could be null or not null, who knows? And there could be a lot of baby code babysitting to match up the is nulls and stuff, whereas the concat is just, I think, very elegantly handling it for you. Yeah, yeah, it's awesome, yeah. We got one more okay, question. Okay, so let's take a look. Oh, yeah, go ahead. Sorry, one more question I thought was really good. Uh, David Chamberlain gave us a chat, and he said, um, and this one is one that I learned when we've gone over this book previously, he said, I thought it was interesting that a set is not ordered. He said he finally understood why order by clauses aren't allowed in CTEs or in views. Right. And, and why is a set not ordered? Because um, Georg Cantor in 1874 said it wasn't. <laughs> well, I, I, I don't know why. But uh, yeah, mathematically, sets aren't ordered. We know that. We've learned that in pre-algebra. And uh, if we're going to base relational databases on set theory, then we need to obey the rules. And that's why it isn't. Yep. Um, OK. Any other? Oh, Rose asked, how do you sign up for the next seminar? Did you answer her? Yes, I did. Yep. Uh, we'll, we'll, OK, cool. OK. All right, so let's go over some SQL flashcards here for a minute. Um, everybody's got their hands down. Is that true? OK. Um, I don't know if we're going to raise hands for this and have people type, but um, let's just kind of go over some questions. The first one is, how many pro uh, many programming languages use an imperative programming paradigm, but SQL uses a declarative one? What does that mean? Um, and I don't know if we want people to raise their hand, but we can just kind of flip over and let me show you this. And it says, SQL allows you to specify what you want to get, not how you want to get it. Um, Rob, can you talk about that for a second? Um, sure. So I think this comes into play with, uh, if anyone read like the just-in-time uh, aspect of SQL that Itzik talks about, of um, you're basically kind of saying, <laughs> like what it says, what I want, you know, I want to select these values from here and where, and then you say go. 
you kind of let the engine and the parser and all the, and the optimizer figure it out and just throw you the data back. Right, right. So let me show you that here. Um, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to say like where um, region equals CA here, and then I'm going to say, I'm going to have a join criteria, join um, sales.orders, oh, let's, let's, let's um, alias those, on c.customerid equals o.customerid. Okay, I'm doing a lot here, right? Let's see if that actually works. Um, oh, is it not? Oh, cust ID, excuse me. Okay. So I'm doing a lot here. And we're, I'm saying, give me these columns from this table, join this table with this criteria. And the way humans read that is we read from left to right, top down. So we say to ourselves, oh, this is going to execute the select first, then the from first, then the join first, then the where first, right? That's actually completely wrong. SQL doesn't execute top-down. SQL has an, a logical order of execution, and that logical order of execution is, uh, is talked about in the select statement um, right here. Let's find that real quick. Um, I bet if I go to my notes. The firmware select. Yeah. Um, yeah, it's definitely from where select group by with having the, with the who, where, what, when, why <laughs> type yeah. analogy. Here for, it is for me. Yeah, for it's, me as a developer, it's from where group by having select and order by. That's the logical way a select statement is ordered. So it's not top down, left to right. It's it's in this specific order, and I'll prove that in just a second. But first, I wanted to show you something else, and that is in Management Studio you can click on these little boxes up here and they're called the ex execution plan. And if I click include actual execution plan and I execute it, I get a new tab in my results. And if I click execution plan, this is the physical execution plan for how this was done. And the first thing it did when it executed this was it looked up um, a clustered index um, for the region and it said, look, scan the entire region for every customer that's in California. And then it did this compute scalar where it did the concatenation. And then it went and found all the orders with the same customer ID. And then it joined them together and so forth. So, so that's the physical plan it used to execute. Right here is the logical plan it used to execute. And, and both of those things were completely independent for how the query was read. Okay, here's another thing that we could talk about that the book covered, and that is the logical way it executes from join where select can be proven by looking at this thing right here. This code that I'm highlighting right now is called a column alias. And if I take that off and I run this code again, Notice that there's no column name. If I add the alias back and I run the code, excuse me, it names the column address line two. Do you guys all see that? Now, what we would like to be able to say is where address line two like San Fran percent, something like that. We'll take that out, OK? So I'm going to execute that, and it's going to say invalid column name. There is no address line to, meaning it didn't know what the alias was. So I'm going to take this out and leave the region back in. And now I'm going to say order by address line to, and I'm going to execute that. And it ordered by it. It ordered by it perfectly fine, right? In fact, I could take the where clause completely out by commenting it out, highlighting that, executing it. And notice that address line 2 is my correct order by um, in this set coming back, and all 830 rows coming back. So let's come back to this. Why did the alias fail in the where clause? 
but it worked in the order by? And the answer is, it's because the order by logically executes after the select. And the select is where the alias was declared, and the where is number two. And that's why knowing how a query is logically processed is important. OK, so that's one thing I thought we'd cover. Um, oh, there was another thing I wanted to cover that I see developers make mistakes all the time in, and that, uh, well, let's see if we can finish the card set, and we'll keep going. Oh, and by the way, that card was, we're, we are a de declarative um, programming method, which is we're specifying what we want to get. We're not specifying how we want to get at SQL. We'll decide that for itself, and you can see that by looking at the actual execution plan. Okay, who invented set theory? I just told you guys. Um, Georg Cantor, and there's a Wikipedia article on that, on him also. And he did it in 1874, so um, 150 years ago almost. Um, is the order in a set important? Somebody already answered that. And the answer is no, it's not important. Sets come back unordered. Who proposed a relational model? This is actually, he's a famous guy for every DBA to know. Brad, you're a developer. Do you know who did it? I do not. <laughs> um, I don't Rob, know either. So. <laughs> you don't, Rob? You know. No. Everybody knows it's EF Cod. You knew it was EF Cod, Rob. There's no way. Oh, OK. We got, we got right. two so, answers in the chat. So, Peter and Parul both got it right. They said EF Cod and Dr. Cod. Yeah. There we go. Yeah, EF Cod, right. And he did it in 1969. Yeah, what year did EF Cod? Okay, so I like the chat. Let's try that again. What are the three values and three value predicate logic? Let's see who can type fast. Let's see who gets it right. There we go. True, false, null. Peter's coming forward. Okay. So let me show you that. We, we were messing around with region before. I'm going to actually do a new query window. I'm going to say select region from sales.customers and execute. Look at all those nulls there. And then a whole bunch that are not null. Now, where three value predicate logic messes everybody up is in the where clause. Well, it also does it in the join clause and in, uh, and in group by, actually. But OK, so we're going to say where region is in California. OK, so notice how many records do I have right here? I have 91 records, right? 91 records. Ah. OK, how many of those records are in California? One. OK, so if I do the inverse of this query and say where region isn't in California, how many records am I going to get back? If one's in California, I should get 91 records back, right? So I'm going to execute that. And I get, look down here, 30 rows. OK, so what happened? And the answer is we didn't, we didn't really understand three value predicate logic. We didn't understand how to deal with null. The reality is that null does not equal false, although we tend to think it does, because it evaluates to false all the time. But null equals unknown. And when you compare a null with a value, the answer will always be false, because we, we don't know what the value will be. So when it did the comparison to California, it said that all the customers with null in the region were false, because we don't know if it's in California. And when you compared it to not in California, all the regions with null in it were false, because the answer is we don't know if it's not in California or not. So we're better off just saying we don't know false, right? So that can be confusing to people dealing with null for the first time. It's, it's confusing to me. But the way I like to think about it is when we don't know something, we just say that it doesn't qualify because we're too scared to make a mistake and say it does. So the way I would do this record, if I have 92 records and one in California, I would say where region isn't in California or region is null. And if I execute that, there's my 90 records. Now we might be tempted 
to make this mistake, which is for region equals null. And if I execute that, I get 30 records. I lose the other ones. And the reason why is even when you compare with null, if a value is null, it returns false. Even when you compare with null, isn't that terrifying? OK, why is that? Um, the reason why is I have a certain amount of money in my pocket right now. And Brad, Brad, if you guess how much money is in my pocket, you can, you can have it. No, 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 no. That's not what we're going to do. We're going to say, if, you, if Brad said it is $30 equal to the money in Ike's pocket, and nobody knows how much money is in my pocket, we're going to return false, right? And if we say is $30 greater than the number of, amount of money in Ike's pocket, we're going to say false, because the answer is we don't know how much money is there. And if we say is the amount of money less than $30 in Ike's pocket, we're going to say false. We don't know. And now, in comparing null with null, if we say if the amount of money in Ike's pocket is the same in the amount of money in Brad's pocket, well, the amount of money in Brad's pocket is also unknown. That's null too. And so we're going to say false. We don't know that we can make that assumption. We don't know that that's true, so we're going to say false. So when you compare null with null, you're comparing an unknown value, the amount of money in Ike's pocket, with, the, with an unknown value, the amount of money in Brad's pocket. And that response is always going to be false. We don't know if they're the same or not. So we're going to say, no, they're not the same. Um, and that's where three-value predicate logic most often bites us. So rather than using an equal sign and a quality operand, we're going to say where region is null, and we're going to find our records that we were looking for. And um, what's the opposite of region is null? It's where region is not, not null. null. Yeah, not null. We execute that. We get 31 records. Oh, because the OR brought in California again. The OR bit us. Right? OK. All right. Um, oh. So next card. And we're running out of time. Uh, so I'll skip some of the easy ones, like primary keys are used for row identifier, foreign key are used to enforce referential integrity. Um, you guys read about first, second, and third normal form. If you have questions, we're happy to answer them in the Google chat. Um, so join the Google group if you haven't already, and we'll answer questions there. Um, how many databases can you have in one instance of SQL Server? Go ahead and type that in if you know it. Anybody do it? As many as the server can handle, yeah. It's actually 32,000. <laughs> yeah, probably you're going to hit that limit, Peter, before you hit 32,767, yeah. Whoa, Brad already talked about a contained database. Oh, what are the three types of T-SQL statements? Do you mean kind of like the, the scope? Well, like, okay, like a select, insert, update is one type of statement. A create table, create procedure, create okay. view is another type of statement. And a grant or deny or revoke is another type of statement. That's the scope. Yeah, Peter's right. DDL, DML, and DCL. Yep. Yep. So DML is data manipulation language. That's like insert, update, delete. DDL is data definition language. That's like create table, drop procedure, alter view. And DCL is data control language, which is used for security, grant, revoke, deny. Yep. Why should you use a use statement in scripts that have T-SQL in them? Anybody? Like a use database statement? Yeah, to make sure, make sure your code's going where you want it to go. <laughs> yeah, how many of you, you don't have to raise your hand, but how many of you have ever created tables in the master database? And I can tell you, I have done that. 
um, and I'm embarrassed by it. But when you run the script and don't pay attention to what database you're in, that's, what's ha that's what happens. And you can blame me for not paying attention that I was in the master database, or you can blame the script author for not uh, using the use statement correctly. But uh, yeah, they should have used use. Why should you terminate every SQL statement with a semicolon? And just in case you didn't know what that was, I added it to the card. Um, so, <laughs> so um, wouldn't that depend a bit on like what kind of statement you're running? Oh, okay. So, um, Rob, you think general that, general SQL question or a T SQL question? It's a T SQL question. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, some commands require it, so you might as well be safe, yeah. It's standard SQL and will be required, that's another reason, yeah. And the third reason is it improves readability. It's just, I think that because SQL ignores white space, ooh, that's, a, that's great to cover if you didn't know that. Like, I can put spaces here, I can put tabs here, I can put a tab here, I can, I can put that there. And I can execute that, and it operates just the same way it did before. 31 records come back. So because of that, using a semicolon reminds us that even though white space is ignored, everything ahead of this is one executable statement. And that's to improve readability. OK. So are you going to bring up semicolon versus go? Oh, I didn't know. Um, so. But I can talk about Go. Go is a T SQL statement that's not in the spec. And it is used to define a batch. So um, oh, hang on. Now I wish I got rid of all that white space because <laughs> with this large font. OK, let me uh, kill this. OK, there's two statements here. And if I put Go here, it submits both those statements to SQL as a unit and it executes them at the same time and returns the results at the same time. That's called the batch. If I had 50 commands here, breaking them up into batches would let my results start pouring in and get parsed separately. And that's why, that's why Go is useful. Um, Go is used pretty much only in areas where the script is executing. Like, it, you wouldn't really need to use it in, like, C-sharp code, because in C-sharp code, you have command.execute, and you would use that to break up your commands. Okay, but yeah, you guys are absolutely right. Okay. What does on-delete cascade do when defining foreign keys in T-SQL? By the way, I'm surprised many you said they run that. Was... Yeah, yeah, test your backups, yeah. Yeah, that's kind of scary. Yeah, somebody wrote, um, if data is in a parent table and it's deleted, it would also delete it in a reference table. Yeah, that's absolutely right. Yeah, um, Peter. And it says that here in the card. It means that rows will be deleted on the referencing table when the row is deleted on the parent table. So when you, when you use on delete cascade in a foreign key, if I delete a customer, and I specified that in the form key of the orders table, it would delete all of that customer's orders, which can be a pretty scary thing if you don't have backup. So um, I would just be aware that's what you're doing. In what order are select clauses logically processed in SQL Server? And we talked about that already, and I won't make you type it in, but it's from where group by having select an order by, like we looked at earlier. Um, what's a drawback of having a space and a table name, like order space details? That was in the book. From that point on, you have to always qualify it. Yeah, you have to, you have to use a literal. Yeah. Like, I prefer square brackets. You can use double quotes if you want, but I like the square brackets, order details like that. I prefer never to do this. I think it's just extra typing. So I like Pascal case where there's no space spaces and any names. Yeah, more typing. Yeah. Yeah, that's right, Shane. Okay. What is the difference between the having clause and the where clause and how are they the same? Okay, well first let's answer how they are the same. What is a where clause and a having clause? What do they do? Both of them have the same job.
filter records. That's exactly what they did. Who, who wrote that? That was David Chamberlain. Yeah, thank you, David. Um, how are they different? Wouldn't it be like when they filter? Yes, yeah. Thanks, Rob. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> the, the, Which, this yeah. is a great follow-up to the, um, the from where select <laughs> order of operations. It is. Right, right, right. Yeah. So the where clause happens before group by, and the having clause happens after group by. And it says that right there. Yeah. So usually if you're using a group by and you have an aggregate, like a sum or a count, and you want to, like here, I'll, uh, I'll do it here where I say, let's do a new query. And I say select, actually, you know what? One of my older queries, this one, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to reuse some work here. Okay. So select star like that. Okay. No order by. And I'm going to get 830 records back just to show you. And now I want to say cust ID, order ID, and execute that. Um, oh, C dot cust ID, and execute that. 830 records back. Now what I want to do is I want to count my orders. So what I want is I want to know that customer ID 1 has six orders here. So I'm going to execute that, and it's going to fail. It says column cust ID is invalid in the select list because it's not contained in either an aggregate filter or a group by clause. Okay, so I'm going to add a group by clause, group by c.cust ID. And now I'm going to see that customer ID 1 has six orders. In fact, I'm going to alias that and call it order count. Yeah, there, cust ID 1 has six orders. And I see a lot of customers that have a lot of orders, like more than 10, and a lot that don't have that many orders. So I'm going to say where count order ID greater than 10. And I'm going to execute that. And it says, oh, an aggregate may not appear in the where clause unless it is in a subquery. Uh, put it in a having clause. So I'm going to say having. But unfortunately, having can't go before the group by. It needs to go after the group by. And there it works. And notice that all those customers that had one, two, seven orders are all filtered out. And these 28 records have 10 orders or more. And that's the big difference between a where and a having clause. Now, a couple things about this, by the way. Why didn't I do this? What's wrong with count star? And the, it was covered in the book. Let's see if anybody responds to that. What was wrong with count star? Yeah, it would include nulls. Thank you very much. Who wrote that? Who said that? David, yeah. Thank you, David. So, yeah, and the reason why that is, what happens if I have a customer that doesn't have an order? Like like Fred. Fred Fred's a customer, and he just hasn't made an order yet. Count star would count Fred because he would show up in the result set. Um, well, he would show up if I had a left join. Um, so once I have a left outer join, Fred would show up as a customer. He has zero orders, but because he showed up in the results set, he would get counted. So to avoid that, I would count my order IDs, and that would keep Fred out of there. Yep. Just okay. real quickly, uh, Peter, I noticed you have your hand up. Did you have a question? Did you want to? Maybe we can unmute you. I'm not sure if you have a uh, mic. Let me let me just go ahead and unmute here. Uh, there we go. Peter, I don't know if you have a mic. Did you have a question you wanted to ask? Uh, maybe he doesn't have a mic. All right, if you had another question, go ahead and type it in the chat. Uh, there's one about using duplicates. And this is exactly what I use that having clause for, is finding duplicates. Oh, right. OK, so um, the way you would do that, and I don't have a good one to do that with, because I don't have a table that has the duplicate problem. That's not the best data set for it. Yeah, if I do from sales.orders, and, and let's say that I thought imp ID was a duplicate, I would say imp ID count order ID. So I'm doing all from one table, group by imp ID having count um, order ID. Uh, let's say 
yeah, order ID greater than one. Now I'm going to get a lot because this is just showing me what employees have made more than one order. But if F ID was a true duplicate, it would show me how many times, you know. Imp ID is a, has 123 duplicates here. Imp ID 4 has 156 duplicates here, right? That's, that's a very popular kind of duplicate query. And that, for eliminating them, yeah, and if you want to eliminate those, uh, one of my favorite tricks is to, throw a, um, is to throw a row ID in front of it and wrap that in CTE, which is uh, just kind of like a contained query. And then when you reference right. that CTE, you just delete every row ID greater than two. Or greater than one. That is that is a great trick. Really yeah, cool that's, trick. That's a good way to do that. Yeah, thank you. Hey, I just wanted yeah, to do a quick a quick time check. We have about four minutes left. I know David had said he had to drop off for a meeting. Maybe a couple other people have to drop off. So let's make sure we maybe wrap it up in the next four minutes. Yeah, actually, you know what? I think instead of going through the rest of the SQL cards, we'll just say. Um, raise your hand if you had a comment or a question that wasn't answered in the book that you wanted help with in the last five minutes. And use the Google group if you have any other questions, and we'll be glad to answer. Um, and next month I'll have a headset. No, that's good. I'm glad. I hope you guys come prepared to contribute and talk to us. We want to get to know you better and create a little culture here where um, we hang out and can see each other at SQL Pass and shake hands and be excited to meet each other. Um, we had we had one more question sitting in the chat. It's been there for a while. I don't know if we addressed it or not from Gary. He mentioned that we were turning three value logic into two value logic. He says null is not false. However, it is not true. I just want to make sure we address that. Right, right. I, I was con probably confusing, and I appreciate him saying that. So that means that I was doing it. I was turning it into two value logic in the context of the WHERE clause, which is what the WHERE clause does. So yeah, null is not false, but WHERE is evaluating any comparison to null is false because it's unknown. It doesn't know how to compare, so it's, it's playing it safe. Um, and the WHERE clause is specific in how it does that. Yeah, thanks for that. Um, anything else? All right, you guys, we'll use the Google group to um, ask questions and discuss things. And if something came up to you in this meeting and you thought, man, I would really like to know more about that, or I just wanted to add my two cents, or if whoever talked earlier mentioned um, his duplicate query with a CTE to filter him out, if you want to post that to the Google group so we can all see it. Um, I, tried to send him a, I tried to send him a response to everyone. But I may have been outsmarted by GoToWebinar. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, we haven't talked about CTEs yet, so maybe when we talk about CTEs, we'll do that. Um, real quick, as I look at our table of contents, um, we covered the first three chapters pretty well, and we, we did it conclusively. And we didn't really talk more about joining, but um, let's do the next three chapters, um, which are subqueries table expressions, and set operators. So why don't we handle chapters 4, 5, and 6 uh, by the next month. And what's our calendar like for the next month? And just to follow up real quick, uh, one person asked in the chat, and I think it's useful for everybody to hear. Uh, we are recording this meeting, so it'll be posted to my YouTube channel. I'll post a link in the Google group. Um, and we have the first meeting up as well, so we'll have we'll have the full video. Uh, the questions, I don't think, come in on the recording, but you'll hear at least what we discussed uh, live. So we're going to meet on May fifteenth, and uh, you guys are going to have a great springtime. And hopefully, the snow is melting, and you're warming up, and you're having a great time. And we'll look forward to seeing you guys in four weeks on May fifteenth. Have a great day, and we'll see you in uh, on the Google group. Thanks, guys. Thanks, everyone. Thank you.